Um, so welcome everyone to our March Equinox Focus event. Uh, we are really excited to have Kip and Dan with us today. And I'll uh, introduce them here in a minute after a little bit of housekeeping. Um, as many of you know, we record these sessions and we put them up on our YouTube channel for your future reference. But just keep in mind that that is a part of, of our process. And uh, we will have all of our past ones are up there as well for um, your viewing pleasure. So as we kick this off, many of us have come across the concept of you know, this, this huge cybersecurity risk. And as business leaders, we sit back and we say, um, I understand that it's there. I understand that it's important, but I'm not real sure whether I've got my bases covered. We've got data sitting in the cloud. We've got insurance. We've got these different things that we think are taking care of this problem. And then we read the news and we get a little bit scared. So I'm really, really pleased to have both Kip and Dan with us today to share some of the, the stories, um, which may scare us to death, but more importantly, the things that we can do as business leaders to protect our workplace. So just some quick introductions before we go into the panel discussion today. Um, first, Kip Boyle is the CEO of Cyber Risk Opportunities. He is a virtual chief information security officer. So many of you have come across virtual outsourced uh, folks, maybe not a chief information security officer. So he's gonna share a little about what that is um, and helps businesses to understand and mitigate cybersecurity risks. He's also the author of the book, Fire Doesn't Innovate, the executive's practical guide to evolving cyber risk. He's well known locally as one of the best resources on this topic. And so we're super happy to have him here today. And then alongside him, uh, Dan Whedon is the president of Toro Consulting and also with uh, First Underwriters. Uh, he's been in the business of helping leaders understand and mitigate risk through business continuity planning and insurance for many, many years. Dan and I have known each other for 10 plus years easy. Um, he's also the author of an ebook entitled Crisis Management for Small and Medium Enterprises. We will make both of these books available to you in the follow-up email uh, that will come after the presentation. It'll have a copy of the recording, the books, and some additional questions and answers if we don't get to all of the information that uh, you all request today. We did receive some questions uh, from our attendees in advance, and we will try to cover those. But if not, like I said, uh, we'll ensure that Kip and, and Dan provide some of those details in that follow-up email. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen so you can see our panelists, and we're going to kick this off. Um, so let's jump right in. Kip, we'll start with you. You kind of coined this term cyber hygiene. I thought it was a really interesting, I don't know, vivid kind of term. So can you start with maybe what is cyber hygiene and why is it important to business leaders? Absolutely. So the origin of the term, it really came around because I, I've worked with senior decision makers for a long, long time. Many of them are not, uh, you know, technically skilled or just don't feel like, you know, they're, they're very technically skilled. And so when you talk about cyber risk and cybersecurity, it's, it's, uh, it's very abstract. Like I really can't show you a photograph of cybersecurity, right? And so that just was a barrier for us to having productive conversations and being able to make really good decisions. And so I really just searched for a way to make the whole idea a little bit more concrete. And what I realized was that people who talk about cybersecurity have already associated it with um, biology, right? So we have computer viruses, you know? Um, and so the whole idea that, that we're, what we're really talking about is something that changes over time and seems to move by itself and, uh, and, and causes infection. So, so I just said, okay, great. If we're going to talk about it in terms of biology, then I'll just grab onto that. And, and so I started saying, well, what do we do to keep, you know, germs out of our system and we, we have hygiene. So I thought, okay, well, let's do, you know, let's talk about it in terms of cyber hygiene because there are digital cooties running around on the internet <laughs> trying to get us, um, you know, but they're, they're all, they're all up there because people, so there's, there's people behind every digital cootie uh, that, that causes trouble. And, and as long as that's true, then that means that they're going to continue to behave like viruses. So the whole idea of cyber hygiene is, you know, what are the things that we can do every day 
that we can incorporate into our lives that help keep digital cooties from causing trouble. And so in my book, I really explored this, I, this idea. And, and, and you know, when we start uh, encouraging people to wash hands, when we first started doing that, it's only been a couple of hundred years since we've understood that good hand washing is a way to keep germs from causing disease. That's hard to believe, I think, in our modern culture, but it but that's true. And to get people to wash their hands took a long, long time. It took decades before hand washing became a common thing as pervasively as it is now. And we still kind of cheat a little bit, right? I think we've all seen people, you know, kind of leave a public restroom and they didn't wash their hands and you're like, ew, you know, why did you just do that? Um, so, um, but anyway, so we got to get really good at cyber hygiene. So I like to, I like to put it in those terms. Yeah. I actually like it too. I think it, it brings it home as far as something we can relate to. So what, what are the good habits that businesses should be thinking about with respect to cyber hygiene and sort of, you know, eliminating these germs and cooties? What sure. Are doing? Yeah. You know, there are not very many silver bullets in my line of work. I wish, I wish I could tell people, you know, if you just do this one thing, right? It's going to make the most difference for you. And possibly it's the only one thing that you have to do. Um, so I'm sorry, you know, like, uh, there's no one thing, but but there are a couple of really super helpful things that that you could do, and so here here's here's my list. So if you're not using two factor authentication or two step verification, I would say that's a top thing for you to learn how to do, and I would turn it on everywhere that you can, and I would start with the online accounts that have the greatest assets attached to them. So typically when I work with customers, that would be bank accounts or anything related to money like QuickBooks. If you do QuickBooks online or what have you, that's another great place to turn on two-step verification. So that's one thing. Now, if you're not doing data backups, that's another thing that you should be doing. The threat of ransomware is, uh, is real and growing and the best way to deal with a ransomware attack if it happens is to have a, a really good fresh backup of data. And the solution for data backup is gonna be different because uh, different size organizations and different ways of, of doing IT are really gonna speak uh, into how you do data backup. But, um, but you want multiple backups, you want one locally, you want one that's com also that's completely detached from your network because uh, like a virus, ransomware has mutated and, and it now infects any backups that it can find. And so you want to make sure that you've, you, you know, that you're really well protected. So there are other suggestions I have, but those are really two of the most effective ones today. If we do this panel again next year, I might say something different because <laughs> the threat will have changed. Yeah, so there, there were a few questions from our attendees um, in advance about, you know, protecting data in the cloud. Or what's our risk if we don't have a substantive quote, internet presence? So what are the, the ways that employers should be educating employees about how to think about their data, how to think about what exists where and what they should be doing to protect it? Yeah. Okay. So um, there's a lot of hyperbole about the value of data, right? And we hear that data is the new oil, uh, you know, things like that. Well, you know, um, hyperbole aside, it's absolutely the case that data is extremely valuable. It's valuable to understand uh, for, from a marketing perspective, people's shopping habits and, and so forth. If you sell complicated uh, machinery like jet engines or, you know, Tesla, um, well, all of those uh, machines are now instrumented and are constantly sending data back to their manufacturers so that so that uh, you know the factory, uh, you know the factories can understand how these things are performing and so forth. So data is incredibly valuable. So you need to tell your folks, look, this data is, you know, it may seem normal and routine to you, but to people outside of our organization, it's extremely worth their effort to to try to get their hands on it. So we need to be careful. The number one thing that I see that causes people to go wrong when it comes to putting valuable data in the cloud is the way they share that data. So getting the right permissions on data that you put into the cloud is, is extremely important. And what's interesting is, is that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we used to have 
all data sharing controlled by the IT department. And these were trained people who knew how to use permissions and how to set permissions and what the different types of permissions meant. Well, now everybody's a, an IT administrator, right? Because we all have the ability to share data through cloud services like Dropbox or Google Drive or what have you. And, and what we see is that people tend to share uh, with very few permissions, you know, they'll put some files up there and then they'll just say, well, if you have the link, you know, you can, you can interact with this data. And what people don't realize is that it, you know, unlike what Hollywood tells us, the uh, cyber criminals out there are not a bunch of bored teenagers pecking away at a, t at a keyboard. They are extremely sophisticated operations that have automated everything. And so they have computers searching the internet 24 hours a day, seven days a week, looking for obscure URLs that will lead to a treasure trove of data. And you can read many stories re recounted in the news uh, about organizations that have uh, resulted in multi-million dollar lawsuits and fines because the privacy of people was violated due to the way people shared data in the cloud. Yeah, I think that's one of the challenges is for us, you know, especially small businesses that, you know, what do I have that people care about, right? I don't have massive amounts of customer data that, you know, tells us how people shop or how people, how people work. So I think part of the problem is the inability to really comprehend why someone would care. I mean, credit card information, social security numbers, yeah, yeah, yeah. But all the rest of it sort of seems yeah. not that material. Yeah, well, you know, espionage seems like a victim, victimless crime. There's no direct consequence, right, of an espionage attack against you, but the um, but the effects will show up later, right? As you know, if you if you sell on an international basis, or at least you know nationwide, and then um, a company from outside the country starts selling their products competitive to you, but at a, but at the same quality, but at a far lower price there's a good chance there was an espionage campaign against your industry in order to provide them with the insights that they needed in order to do that. So it's very squishy when it comes to espionage. But you know what? Here's the thing. Even if your data isn't valuable to other people, a ransomware attack that will separate you from your data, well, guess what? You know, the fact that you can't get your data back because perhaps you didn't have the right backups, data backups, is really all that a ransomware attacker needs to do. They don't. They may not care about the data at all. They're just going to separate it from you, and you know that's going to cause a lot of trouble. Yeah. Thanks. So we've seen, or at least in the media, we've seen kind of some additional conversations about how the shift to a more virtual workforce has exacerbated this or made it more readily available. The data more readily available to. Um, ransomware attacks, cybersecurity attacks. Um, Dan, maybe you want to jump in on this first, but what do you see as the most significant risks to the virtual workplace um, and the exposure that businesses have both now as it's been somewhat temporary and then in the future as I think people are shifting to maybe a more permanent solution that's a virtual workplace? Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. One thing I, I do want to mention, I love cyber hygiene and Kip Boyle is somebody who is just an expert on this. I always learn something new. Uh, what I always tell people is, is that uh, when hygiene fails, there's insurance. Uh, <laughs> just, as, just as we all learned how to be better hand washers during the virus, uh, people who still wash their hands, they still got COVID. Uh, so what insurance is, is, is it's really the place to clean up the financial mess so to speak, that comes from that. And when you're talking about virtual, uh, the toothpaste is out of the tube, right? Uh, no matter what, there's going to be some element moving forward of virtual working. And the biggest challenge from an insurance standpoint, and I'm sure Kip can talk about from a security, but from an insurance standpoint is not all cyber insurance policies are the same. And so, Let's just say, Michelle, you're, you took out a cyber insurance policy for your business. All of a sudden, you find that all of your employees are working virtually, right? And maybe I'm one of your employees. And so I'm working from home. And all of a sudden, my personal computer, which I'm working on, I'm, I'm, I'm going in to all of the, the, the places that I, I need to to get our information. But all of a sudden, my personal uh, personal device 
and it could be a laptop, it could be my, my desktop, it could be my phone, that gets compromised. And through that, you have a claim. Well, you might have an insurance policy for cyber, but if it doesn't cover something called bring your own device. So now we're not only bringing our own bottle, we're bringing our own device, BYOD. Well, there, there might not be coverage because the, the criminals accessed my personal computer, not a computer you owned. When I'm working in your office, I'm using your computer, but once I'm now outside, I'm not. And so that becomes an important part of the whole working virtually moving forward. Yeah, I wanna add about cyber insurance. Dan's absolutely right. It's really critical to have because just like in real life, you know, you can wash your hands and have wonderful cyber hygiene, but it only takes, you know, one, uh, one time for a cootie to, to get you. And then, and then you need to see a doctor. Now, um, this is, this is real. I'll give you an example right now. I'm managing a ransomware attack that happened to a mortgage broker. They've got two offices. They've got about 140 people working for the company, but they're completely shut down. And they reached out to me and I said, um, I'm so sorry, what can I do to help? And so we started talking and, and I asked them, I said, well, one of the first things I need to know is, do you have a cyber liability policy? And they said, no, we don't. And I said, oh, I'm really sorry to hear about that. I know what to do, but I just want to tell you that it's going to take a little longer because if you had a cyber liability, liability policy, the first thing we do is call your, uh, call your carrier and they would have a whole panel of experts, including digital forensics people, um, a data breach coach, and it would all just be part of, you know, the the uh, the features of your policy. And we would work with them, and it would streamline things an awful lot, and it would and it would reduce your your payments, uh, your you know the direct payments that you need to make. I said, but because you don't have it now, we're going to have to assemble a team, and I'm going to have to go find out who's available, and that's going to cause delay. And, and of course, it's going to cost, uh, you know, more money and you'll get several invoices from different companies. And so I know you can handle that, but, you know, one of the things that we're going to have to do is make sure you have a great policy on the other side of this. And I think along those lines, the immediate, what do I do now question, um, the, the insurance is a great place to go, even though it may not solve all your problems, it may not cover every situation. They have the resources to support you and help you through yeah. that process, well, which is a scary And Michelle, and, and if I, oh, if, if I, I wrote one quick story, if you don't mind, uh, I, I have a client that was in a, they have five different locations. And we had talked about, I do all of their insurance, but uh, we talked about cyber. And his, he made this decision, the owner, that we don't have as much of a need. Even we, we talk about it, 50%, by the way, 50% of small business owners still don't carry cyber insurance. Three months later, I got a call from his uh, office, I would say office manager, or head of operations, who happens to be his wife. And she said, you'd offered us a cyber insurance uh, a few months ago. I said, yeah. She goes, uh, I, I need to know what that was. And, and I said, why, what happened? Well, they had a ransomware attack and it affected all five locations. What happened was, is that they didn't lose anything. However, it damaged their equipment in all five locations to the tune of about $15,000. Well, if you took out the insurance premium and you took out uh, you know, the deductible, they ended up losing about $13,000 in, in, the, in the process. And so even if nothing was stolen, the damage to the equipment is, could be significant. And there could be other problems too, right? Lost revenue and yep. um, you know, uh, impaired productivity. Um, so that's a, that's a great story, Dan. And I like how it illustrates that even if you're a small organization, a policy makes a lot of sense. Now, one of the things I want to caution people about is um, cyber liability policies are different. There are what, 200 plus different policies right now. They're non-standard. 
And so it's not like shopping for car insurance where you can do an, an apples to apples comparison. It's actually very dif difficult to know that you're getting a good deal and that you have all the right coverages. And so somebody like Dan is going to be invaluable because he knows how to take an apples to oranges situation and turn it into an apples to apples comparison. Yeah, I think that goes back to this, you know, I don't know what I don't know part of, of this conversation, right? I know right. that there's a risk. I don't even know what that risk looks like because as you mentioned, you know, it's the cooties piece and the cooties can take a lot of different um, different sizes and styles and risks. Um, we talked a little bit about the risks to businesses, but I want to kind of, you know, go down to the small and medium-sized enterprises. And we talked about... Um, Bring your own device. We've talked about insurance, but if you don't have, you know, the ability because of either funding or knowledge to build a really sophisticated infrastructure, what are the other things that small and mid-sized businesses should be thinking about um, to tackle this? Well, I can offer a couple of others. So, you know, we so just to recap, we talked about two-factor authentication or two-step verification. We talked about having good data backups. Um, there are some, and, and we've talked about insurance, right? Those are three things that I think anybody of any size can do, even individuals can do those. Um, but some other things that are, are very effective. So if you're a business and you have uh, either subcontractors or vendors that you work with, well, we know that the vast majority of data breaches are caused by third parties. And so one of the most straightforward things that you can do is uh, make sure that your contracts that you're using have, um, have the correct language in there. Setting expectations for how uh, third parties that you bring into your business are supposed to protect data and also uh, accountability. So what happens if they are, it turns out, responsible for causing a data breach? You know, uh, do you have uh, clauses in your contracts that are going to hold them accountable uh, from a liability perspective? Do you require them to have their own cyber liability policy? And are you a named insured on that policy? So this is something that can really pay off for you. And this is just a simple administrative action that, that you need to take, right? You don't have to be a technological expert to do that. And it can really, uh, it can really protect you. Dan, what do you what do you what would you suggest? Well, you you you, you hit a couple of buttons where I, I would have said the exact same thing about the additional insureds. One of the things that uh, I am seeing more and more is pressure, what I would call supply chain pressure on businesses to carry cyber liability insurance, to have the the verbiage in place, the contractual ver verbiage. Uh, that is becoming more and more required by somebody else because they, they realize exactly what you said is that, that it's a third party that's coming in on that. So, uh, you know, you, you, when you're talking technology stuff, that's exactly what you're talking about and the extra step to make sure that you're financing that risk. Uh, that's where I come in is that you're, because people think insurance and, and, a lot of times they have a negative connotation. What you're really doing is financing your risk and making sure that any liabilities that come from that are being paid by someone other than you. Yeah, this is this is great because you know we we see contracts you know of course all the time and and Dan you mentioned earlier that you know insurance is kind of your second line of defense after your procedures and your hygiene and sort of the the same idea with contracts when we talk about in an ideal world you insulate whatever that risk is within that the terms of that contract. So if you can cover under the terms of that contract, that is, you know, your best bet. And then insurance comes in after the fact. And so in this case, if you haven't looked at your independent contractor agreements or your vendor agreements in, you know, five years, it likely doesn't cover any of this because this wasn't something people were talking about five years no. ago. No, and I think that goes back to the fact that cyber is a dynamic risk, not a static risk. It's changing all the time. It's hard to keep up with. And uh, we have in my profession what we call zero-day exploits. And a zero-day exploit is kind of an interesting little term, but all it means is that somebody can attack us with no warning and can exploit a vulnerability that nobody even knew existed. And a good example of that is, uh, you know, if we're using Microsoft Windows products 
somebody has has taken the Windows uh, operating system apart in a laboratory and they've discovered different bugs and flaws and they can weaponize those. The National Security Agency has done this over and over and over again. And in 2017, they actually lost control of an entire cyber arsenal. And, and, and uh, one particular weaponized exploit that, no, that not even Microsoft knew about, but the NSA knew about and kept it you know, from Microsoft was picked up and it was used to attack the Ukraine. Now you might think, well, I don't do business in Ukraine, so you know, not a big deal. But this particular uh, exploit was weaponized to the point where it ran amok and it ended up causing uh, billions and billions of dollars of damage to companies that, that weren't, weren't even doing business in Ukraine because the virulence of, of, of what became known as not Petya, but it was incredibly virulent and it just ran from network to network to network. And it caused giant enterprises like, like Merck, the pharmaceutical company, and Maersk, the shipping company, to, to grind to a halt. And the only way they could do business was to start using, you know, pencils and paper. Who can even remember how to do that? Um, so, so even when we're not targeted, it, you know, we can just be a battlefield casualty caught in the crossfire. And things are just, that's how dangerous things can be. Michelle, can I ask Chip a question? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and I've had this, this is a common objection that I hear when I'm talking about insurance. And it's usually a smaller business or smaller nonprofit organization that says, we don't, we don't take any money. Uh, and if we do, uh, it's a third party. Uh, we don't have any personal identifiable information. We really feel like we're not at risk. Now I have my, my standard that I, I tell people, but I, I think you might be even a better, uh, storyteller on that, what would you say to people who say, ah, I, I, I don't have anything that anybody would want? Well, so there's so much I could say about that, but I'll just, <laughs> th but I'll just say this. Okay. And if anybody wants to talk more about this, you know, I'm happy to have a conversation later on, but the truth is, is that there are some people in the world who are senior decision makers for their organizations and nothing you or I can say to them. There's no story we can tell. There's no statistic we can supply that will change their mind. They really do think that they're not in any danger at all. And so when that happens, what I kind of think to myself is, you know, I'm trying to sell life insurance to an immortal it's just not going to happen. <laughs> and so I, I, I thank them for their time. I shake their hand and I wish them well. And I do wish them well. Like I hope that, that it doesn't happen. But, but then I move on because the, it, I'm not going to change their mind, right? It's just not going to happen. Now they're going to have to uh, either learn that they really are at risk for this Either, either it's going to happen to them and it's going to change their mind. Or another thing that sometimes happens is a good friend of theirs or a close colleague will have a, a cyber event. They'll go through a lot of pain. And then that will cause the person I spoke with to rethink the situation. And this happens a lot. I was, I was working with an agricultural company in Eastern Washington who got ransomware and it shut down their ability to pack fruit uh, for, uh, for a couple of weeks. And so they realized that they were at risk. And so, you know, uh, they started working with me and, and, and I'm helping them recover, but also prevent this from happening again. Well, a couple of months down the line, I got a phone call from a competitor of theirs across town and they said, yeah, we heard what those guys went through. We don't want that. So would you come and help us too? So, you know, I, that's just the reality out there today. What do you all recommend about um, employee training? Is there is there something that they that organizations should do company wide to raise the awareness of of these issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first the first and most important thing, although this can be kind of the toughest thing, is senior decision makers. Uh, influential people in, in the organization need to walk the talk because if they don't, then no matter what they say, it's not probably going to be very effective. 
So I wrote, one of the reasons why I wrote my book was to help senior decision makers uh, kind of warm up to this whole topic and to be able to talk about it with people using non-technical language, right? So they don't need to be ones and, you know, be able to speak with ones and zeros. So if they read part one of my book, it's going to help them feel like, hey, I, you know what, I can show some leadership on this topic. And I think they can. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, is that you, you, you definitely want to include your employees. What I do is I start my, com my customers off with a free uh, account um, at a cloud-based uh, security training organization. And I say, you know what, this, this organization here has a freemium model. So that means, you know, you can, you can get in there and get a free account for everybody on your team. It's an hour's worth of training. It's, it's engaging. It's kind of fun. And so that's where I start my customers off with is with that. And of course you can go from there and I think you should build on it, but I think that's a good first start. Um, Dan, what do you, what do you tell your customers on this? I, I, I tell them that not only is it part of good business continuity planning, it also, because first of all, the best insurance, insurance is completely reactive, completely reactive. And so if you can not have, if you can prevent first, that's, that's number one. And so any type of, of education and, and Michelle, you mentioned people in a virtual uh, situation. Kip, I saw, I saw some research or some studies that said that when people went home and started working from home, their diligence towards clicking on links, uh, it, it got lighter. I mean, they, they were, in other words, they were more prone to click on a phishing uh, a scam than they were uh, from home. And so I think the training as part of a, a, a business continuity as part of what you would do uh, to train somebody on a forklift. You have to be constant on that. And because this is ever changing, you probably have to be doing it on a quarterly basis at least. Yeah, it should be, it should be frequent. It can't be too frequent. I like quarterly. I think that's, uh, yeah. I think that's reasonable. Um, but, you know, people are very focused on what their particular job is. They should be because, you know, we have to make money and we have to serve customers. So they need to be reminded. Well, there's a question in the chat um, and it's a good segue into the <laughs> conversation about mm -hmm. cyber insurance. Um, the question is specifically around common exclusions, but, but maybe Dan, you can talk a little bit about the differences in policies that yeah. kind of you mentioned earlier on in the, in the program. Yeah, I just saw Ashley, I was going to answer that. So you, you led me right to it. Let me start with, with saying this is that when you're talking about cyber insurance, there's two things to, you know, kind of from a basis just to define it. It's first and third party risks. Mm -hmm. So what you think of in a first party risk is this, it's the stuff that happens to you. Damage to, your, damage to your equipment, business interruption for, for loss of income, breach response costs, cyber extortion or ransomware, public relations costs. Those are all first party. Third party is the stuff that happens to someone else and it's your fault. Uh, so losing personal identifiable information for your employees or clients, any defense and penalties for regulatory, PCI fines, things like that. So that's what it's set up to do. It's going to cover the, your loss and the loss of somebody else where it's, it's your fault, it's your negligence. Uh, the other thing before I get to some differentiations is there's, and this is where all the, all the companies are different. Uh, we work with a company that basically they say, we sit on your front porch. Uh, we, we, want to, we want to stop somebody from coming inside the house, so to speak. And so I've actually had them email our mutual clients saying, uh, you have a port open or something like that. Kip will know what that means. I'm not sure I know exactly what, but you have a port open. Uh, please tell your IT person to fix it uh, because you're, you're, now, <laughs> you're, you're now potentially uh, vulnerable. And so insurance actually, the, the right cyber insurance actually goes beyond just paying out money. When something happens, they can be proactive. Oh, the exclusions, that's something like Kip just said, I could talk for quite a long time. It's hard because these are not 
uh, it's not easy for me to say, oh, this is a list of exclusions. What you have to know, because bring, bring your own device could be excluded. That, you know, so there, there are things that you have to go through when you're doing a, a review of cyber liability that needs to be made sure that what you're comparing might be apples and oranges. And so there's no common exclusions on that. And so I'll give one other example. If it happens internally, what if it's your, what's it, what if it's a disgruntled employee? We all know that insurance doesn't cover intentional acts normally, right? Especially if it comes from your employee, but what happens if it's your employee who didn't have to hack into your system? They already had access to your system. And so that becomes a potential problem, especially uh, even if you haven't terminated somebody uh, and they're still in there. Uh, one other topic, because I'll forget about this on the insurance part. I also work with a lot of companies, especially nonprofits that have to purchase directors and officers insurance. And many of the people watching this may serve on a nonprofit board or be active on that. And they're familiar with directors and officers. For a nonprofit organization to not buy cyber is a risk to that directors and officers insurance. Because if somehow, somewhere there was a breach and it cost the organization money, those directors and officers could be sued for negligence in not purchasing cyber insurance. So I was thinking of that while, while Kip was talking about something else, like I have to bring that up because there is a domino effect now, and that, that, that counts for for-profit organizations that have directors and officers as well. Yeah, Dan, I wanna ask you one quick question. Sure. When cyber uh, insurance first started to become uh, purchased and the market for that started to grow, one of the common exclusions was, uh, was third-party coverage, right? So yeah. it was common to have first, but not to have third unless you explicitly asked for it. And a lot of people didn't understand that. And you can go on the internet and you can do searches for a lot of companies that actually filed lawsuits because they thought third party was covered when it wasn't. Is it common now to see third party as part of the, the you know, like the base uh, coverage? Is that something to worry about? Yeah, it, it, it's actually common now, <laughs> Kip. In fact, uh, the companies that I get uh, proposals from, they lead with third party. <laughs> that's, that's, that's become because you're talking about your negligence and negligence doesn't mean you did it on purpose. It's just, it's your fault. Uh, somebody got in through you and damaged somebody else. And because of the fines, because of the assessments we've seen, we've probably all had uh, somebody say, hey, you used your credit card at our hotel and it got, you know, it, 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 it uh, got compromised. We're going to pay for a year or two years worth of monitoring. Well, that could get really, really expensive depending on how, you know, and so all of a sudden that third party liability became more important. And in, in short, yes. Uh, in, in fact, if you got a proposal that did not include third party, I'd, I'd run from that insurance proposal. Yeah. yeah. If anybody wants to read about this, there's a, there's a really um, uh, uh, high profile case, P.F. Chang's uh, had to file a lawsuit over this issue. If you, if you if you're interested, just do a Google search on PF Chang's and uh, cyber insurance, and you can you can take a look at that. But you know, coverages are are being litigated. Um, that's kind of you know the the state of maturity right now for cyber insurance. But don't let that scare you. You really do need a, the best policy you can afford. Uh, one other thought, because you'd asked uh, it was Ashley's question about exclusions. You want to make sure that you have what's called TRIA or terrorism risk insurance uh, on your cyber policy. The reason is, is as we are all seeing in the news, uh, terrorism can happen online and you don't have to be Target or Home Depot to have that. So you want to make sure that your coverages also include that. That is not an automatic. Dan, are you seeing um, the insurance providers requiring some sort of um, processes, policies, infrastructure, you know, in, in, for instance, employment practices liability, they're going to ask for your handbook or they're going right. to ask for your COVID policy. Are you seeing the same thing on the cyber side? Yeah, the applications have, have become a little more sophisticated. 
Uh, in fact, Kip talked about education. The questioning now is, are you doing two-factor fa authentication? Are you putting in encryption? Are you doing education? These are all yes, no's. And as you might imagine, uh, those impact A, your ability to get cyber or B, the cost of it. And so, uh, yes, we're starting to see very similar to employment practices liability, more questioning coming in. Now, I will tell you, cyber insurance costs are going down over the past year because insurance carriers are starting to understand it. Insurance carriers hate what they don't understand <laughs> and what they don't have, what they don't have a history of. And so they're starting to figure that out, but they're also figuring out we've got to be more diligent in our application because we want to make sure that somebody who's doing that, by the way, there are some companies will give deals on things like two-factor authentication. Uh, one of our carriers will actually drop the deductible in half. If you have two-factor authentication and it, you still got breached, they'll pay for it, but you'll pay half the deductible because you had it in place. So that's how the variances go. And, and, and there's a lot more questions, but there's a lot more potential bells and whistles, but you have to know that they're there. There's a question in the chat and it kind of leads me to um, something else we wanted to talk about here, which is the privacy legislation. It's been very much a patchwork of state by state uh, requirements kind of being led by GDPR in, in the EU, but you know, within California and New York and Nevada and uh, most recently, I think it was Virginia. What does this mean for um, the average business? What do they need to know? Uh, what is What do these laws typically uh, require sort of from an implementation standpoint? And to the specific question in the chat, you know, what are you required to do if you have a breach? So this is, this is uh, really about privacy, right, Michelle? But yeah, the, the laws are, are privacy, but a lot of them do cover, you know, security as well, as far as yeah. Well, so uh, it, it's just, this is a tough time for senior decision makers because not only is the actual threat uh, dynamic and changing and evolving, but so is our regulatory environment doing the same thing. And so, um, so what's required is changing. And I often partner when I'm working with, with my customers with, uh, with an attorney because that's, that starts to get into legal advice, right? And I can't render that. I can tell them what, um, what I think is going on as a practitioner, right? As an operating manager, right? I can tell you my understanding of it. But to really know, especially if you find yourself in the middle of an incident, you really need to consult a knowledgeable attorney and, and, you need to, and, you need, and that's where you need to get your guidance from because there's multiple layers of requirement, it's going to depend so much on uh, the kind of business that you uh, that you're in and the the customer base that you serve. So there's really no, I don't think, I don't know of you guys. If you know it, tell me now. But I don't know that there's a canned stock response to that question based on what's really happening out there. But Michelle, what do you think? Yeah, I think that um, it, it's interesting when you look at the patchwork of the legislation that's been put in place in the U.S. and they they take very different approaches to what is privacy, what is a breach, and what are you required to do. So you know the fact that you are not you know actively operating in California doesn't mean that CCPA doesn't apply to you. Um, and so it's very much as you mentioned a case by case basis. And you may find when you have a breach that three or four or five of these apply to you when you didn't even realize that they do. So understanding yeah. this and getting proactive around your privacy policy, your terms of use, you know, the, the contractual obligations that you're putting on your vendors as well, I think is a huge part of the um, kind of interchange around a breach and privacy sort of, of how the, the two things dovetail. Yeah. Um, and and, and I, by I, the way, really quickly, that's one from an insurance standpoint, you have to read the policy because you talked about the California uh, privacy, that's not automatically covered. <laughs> so there's penalties for some things, but you, you may not have it there. In fact, one of the carriers that we use a lot, 
they have two forms. They have what's called an admitted form and a non-standard form. Both are fine, but they, they do different things. And the non-standard would cover that automatically where the admitted wouldn't. And so I have to keep that in mind when I'm talking to clients and how they're doing business. And so I think you're going to see an increase because as you mentioned, some states, the, when you're working online, you're, you're basically potentially selling to anybody. And so you might automatically, without even knowing it, be taking part in that and not have coverage for it. Yeah, and I want to talk for a moment about um, the difference between cybersecurity and privacy. There is a relationship. Absolutely, there's a relationship. But, but there's, a, there's a, a couple of key differences. And, and one of them is, is that privacy is, is largely um, business decisions that you make about what data you're going to collect. And, and then what you're going to do with that data, right? So if you collect data for marketing purposes, um, or yeah, so can, can, you know, what did you tell people when you collected it? Because that's going to determine what you can use it for. And then you also need to be clear about things like, well, if I sell somebody something and I, now I know their information, uh, do I, can I only talk to them about you know, product related or service related issues, or can I also market to them, you know, as, as a separate thing in the future, right? So that's, that's, you know, those are the kinds of privacy issues that you've got to figure out. No cybersecurity professional can really tell you what those answers are um, or what you should be doing. But where I come in is when you've collected this data, you've decided that this is the data that you want to collect because that's what's going to allow your business to flourish, and, but then it gets compromised, right? So I can help you protect the data that you've chosen to collect. And I can help you deal with any incidents that might arise from a cyber attack or just a mistake, right? An error that might be made by somebody on your team. But, um, but I'm not really the person to go to, to, to find out, you know, what data do you need to collect? And so you might need, that's where you, I think you're going to want to consult a, a, a knowledgeable attorney on privacy. And by the way, not, not every attorney knows what the answers are here. So if you've got, say, an outside general counsel, um, they may or may not be up to speed with the latest. So, you know, ask them if they, you know, if, if they have been keeping up with, with it or if they need to refer you to somebody who, you know, who practices in that area a lot. Thanks, Kip. I think that's absolutely that's absolutely right. So this goes into, you know, what are the disclosures that you're required to make based on what you're doing operationally, and where do you put those, and making sure that you stay up to date on that. Um, I'm going to, uh, you know, hit on another question here um, that I think is really relevant, and it asks about how we can rely on, or can we rely on third-party vendors in keeping up with the necessary protections. Um, you know, we put our data in the cloud and we read the terms of use and we know that there's a whole bunch of things that they say, you know, that you're responsible for and they're not responsible for, even though they seem like they should be responsible for those things. Um, but as this changes, are, are these vendors staying on top of what is necessary from a security standpoint? What, what I've noticed is a couple of things. The first is, is that, there's a lot of marketing around how secure cloud is. And I think it has a lot of security potential. What they don't tell you up front is that you have a role to play. You have, a, you have to play a very active role in making sure that any data that you put into the cloud is secure. But that's also actually true for products that you purchase and install on your own computers. You still have a role to play, whether that's setting permissions or, uh, or making sure that in the case of an anti-malware product that you are getting updates for it. Because if you're not getting updates for it, it's not going to be that useful. It's going to leave gaping holes in your, in your defenses. So, um, so make sure you go out there if, to any cloud provider that you're thinking of using and find out about what's called the shared responsibility model. 
And that's those those keywords that I gave you right there are pretty common in the industry. Uh, if you go to AWS, for example, you know, they'll talk about that and they'll tell you and they'll even you know they got a lot of materials and some of them are visual, which I appreciate. But they'll tell you, you know, how much of the security you can expect from from them and how much of it is completely in your hands. So I gave the example earlier today about if I'm you know, if you're going to share data through a cloud provider, well, you got to get the permissions correct. That's all on you. They're not going to, they're not going to do that. They're going to give you the ability to set permissions, but how you set them is your choice. Now, in contrast, one of the great things about cloud providers is you don't have to worry about data centers anymore. You know, you don't have to worry about, are they secure enough? Is the closet that you've put your, you know, your file and print server in at, at your office location, you know, sufficiently protected? All that worry about physical security is pretty much taken care of by, you know, uh, cloud providers. So, so there's some stuff you'll get that's automatic and you don't think about it, but there's still quite a bit that you've got to pay attention to. And in terms of things like, um, like firewalls and, and antivirus and that sort of thing, um, the problem with those products is that, uh, is that the real cyber attacks that are taking place today and are causing the most damage don't have anything to do with firewalls and, and antivirus products. What they have to do is, is with manipulating the emotions of your staff. And there's really no technological solution to that, which goes back to our earlier conversation about why it's so important to train them and to have the right protections in case something bad happens, because it's inevitable that somebody is going to fall for a phishing scam and, and they're going to transfer money they shouldn't, or that they're going to click a link that, that they really should not have clicked on. So it's a very dangerous world out there. Can I add one quick thing to what you were mentioning about vendors, Michelle? Uh, you, you, me you mentioned, um, Oh, I mentioned supply chain pressure. Uh, you're going to, I think that this is increasing and that it's going to be a requirement uh, for all businesses that vendors, suppliers, all carry cyber liability insurance. I think the 50% uh, is going to start changing. And I predict somewhere in the next five years, it's, it's just going to be automatic. You need to provide, if you're working with us in some way that includes or involves technology, uh, you have to carry cyber liability and we're gonna ask for a certificate of insurance and additional insured language. I just think that's gonna become common. So let's uh, kind of wrap up with, if, if you have some sort of an incident, what do you do? Well, if you have a cyber liability policy, the first call should be to your carrier because they're going to, because if you've bought a policy that does more than just check a box that says I have insurance, because you can buy those policies out there, right? You can buy a policy that has bare bones, you know, coverage at the lowest possible premium. And you can say you have it, but what you really want is a policy where you have a data breach coach that's available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, you know, so if you've got that policy, that's the first call you, that you need to make. Now, if you don't have that policy, now it's more of a do-it-yourself situation. And so you have to you know, think about, my gosh, who do I know that can, that can fill in and play that role of data breach coach for me? And that could be somebody like myself. I'm, I'm really an, uh, a, a, an operations management type of a, of a person. I come in and help you get control of the situation, restore operations, and at the same time, figure out, um, you know, how to navigate uh, all the different things that are coming at you, like, like a $500,000 ransom demand that's going to double to a million dollars in seven days if you don't pay it by the deadline. Well, you know, do you need to do that at all? And I, uh, now, there are some other things if in case of a ransomware attack, again, if you're doing this on your own, you're going to need to find an attorney. You're going to need to notify the FBI. Now, the reason why you need to do that is because let's say you do need to make a ransom payment. If you pay that ransom to the wrong crim cyber criminals, you could be violating United States law regarding economic sanctions. So if it's the North Koreans that are attacking you, and it's difficult to know this, but there are ways of finding out if it's the North Koreans attacking you or Iranian cyber attackers and you pay them without 
the approval of the U.S. government, then that could result in some serious consequences for you because then you've given material aid and support to known terrorist organizations. So these are very difficult issues to, to run through. So you're going to want somebody like me. You're going to want somebody like, uh, like you know, you're going to want a knowledgeable attorney who specializes in data breaches and that sort of thing. And you're going to want to notify the FBI. You're generally not going to talk to local police until later when you may need to file a, a police report of loss. Um, but I wouldn't put them at the top of your list. Now, if you have insurance, just call your insurance carrier and it's a one-stop shop. Anyway, that's my experience. But, you know, anybody, uh, Michelle or Dan, did, do you see it differently? Uh, no, I, I don't see it differently. And the good insurance companies, the good cyber, they all have 24-7 call the coach, call with the consult, whatever, whatever it is. Um, I would like, uh, Michelle, something just popped into my mind. I want to take about 10 seconds. Invoice manipulation and fraud. I, I should have mentioned that as part of um, what insurance covers. Uh, what we're seeing more and more of on the fraud side is a bad actor sending an invoice <laughs> that to your client, yeah. the client recognizes, hey, it's from, from Dan or Kip or Michelle and they pay it, but it didn't go to you. So we're seeing more and more of that invoice man manipulation fraud. Uh, that's not, again, automatically covered on all cyber policies. And it just, it popped in my head and I wanted to get that out yeah. there, that that is a growing error area. And by the way, if, if what I told you is unnerving about what do you do when you don't have a cyber liability policy, <laughs> then you should make a plan. <laughs> so you don't yep. have to guess yep. when it happens. And, and all practice these your plan things that, that we're running into, you know, clients who are experiencing this on a, on a pretty regular basis. Now, the, the emotional manipulation, the invoice manipulation, those are pretty common. And so the training is, is huge, but as we, as we wrap up, wanted to just, you know, highlight the need for a policy, um, a, a plan that the company knows what to do when this comes up. Who to bring together? Who are the key stakeholders? Uh, your your attorney, your insurance, your IT folks, um, your PR people possibly, and understand how to leverage each of those folks within within that construct um, of the plan and be sure that you're you're practicing it. You know, you may depending on you know what are the causes and the roles in this. You know, want all these conversations to be under attorney client privilege. You need to think about these things before you start to talk openly um, with your clients and with the public about yeah. it. I'm glad you mentioned PR experts, Michelle, because one thing that uh, customers of mine don't understand, generally speaking, is that in, in the case of a ransomware attack or a large cyber attack of, of any kind, a denial of service attack or whatever, the number one digital asset at risk at that point is not your money. It's your reputation. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be careful about how you uh, manage the situation with your stakeholders. So you've got vendors, you've got partners, you've got customers, you've got the general public, people who are not customers yet, but you probably would like the opportunity to serve them. So you've got to include that in your response plan. How are you going to manage the communications that you send out? And here's the thing. If you do it poorly, your, your, your reputation can be really tarnished. But what we also know is that if you do a good job of this, and I don't mean masterful, but good job of this, your reputation can actually be better coming out of it than it was going in because you have an opportunity to uh, increase trust by being transparent, by being forthwith. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's what I see is the difference between people who, who do this well and, and the ones that don't do it as well. And Kip, the good news is, is that the right insurance policy pays for PR costs. There you go. <laughs> so, now I wish I sold insurance. <laughs> <laughs> so we are right at time. Um, thank you guys for your questions. Thank you all for joining us today. This contact information will be in the follow-up email as well. And then I always like to highlight our upcoming programs. Um, on April 6th, we're doing an Equinox open house. A um, little after the equinox, but welcome to spring. Just a chance to chat with our attorneys and our team and, and catch up a little bit since we don't get to do this in person quite as often. 
in April 22nd, we're doing a program on mastering difficult conversations with um, Swift HR. This is something they typically do for a fee. So we are not able to record it, but it is a fantastic program, um, especially for HR folks and folks who are, are really talking about um, difficult situations with their employees and vendors and, and other folks. And then on May 20th, we're going to have a program on exiting your business. What are the current trends um, in deals? Uh, we've got the uh, potential uh, capital gains tax coming up. We've got sort of post-COVID valuations. What does the world look like today? And so that's on May 20th. Again, wanted to say thanks, especially to Kip and Dan for joining us today. What an amazing program and the information is so incredibly valuable to all of us who are navigating these ever-changing waters. So thanks so much and have a fantastic day. Bye everybody. Bye everyone.